Welcome everyone back to the Dark Forest. I hope that you all are having a fantastic night. As I sit here around this campfire, I'm eating this bacon and egg and cheese breakfast burrito from Ponchos, tapping it with a little ketchup and tapatio. Yeah, it's going down tonight in the Dark Forest. Anyways, sit back and relax, grab some munchies and... Let's get spooky. Banshee. Banshee. Come here, boy, said my friend Luke. We sat in a completely dark room. Nothing lit up other than the candles. There was silence. I knew this game was bullcrap, I remarked. You never know, Kyle. It might work, replied Luke. Don't even get me started. I know you don't believe in ghosts, but I heard panting. Luke went silent. I could see his face with the warm, dim glow of the candlelight. He swallowed hard. It's probably my own dog, I whispered. Luke held a finger over his lips. He had convinced me to play a ritual game with him, one called Banshee. It involved a long-dead Doberman Pinscher that doesn't like the idea of being woken up from its restless sleep. Luke kept a dog treat held tightly in his hand. I could see him shaking. My dog Molly trotted out from the darkness. She was a Maltese. Looked completely innocent in nature like she wouldn't even bark at the mailman. Luke signed and I laughed at him. Are you sure you know how this game works? I asked. I looked at the rules, Kai. I don't believe it in the first place. Dog ghost? And what is the point of the ritual in the first place? If you can keep Banshee tame, he protects you. Car crash? You'll survive. Heart attack? Banshee is there by your side. So how does a ghost dog stop me from having a heart attack, Luke? Don't ask me. I'm just hoping this works in the first place. Uh, hoping. Meaning you don't actually believe in it, do you? If you could have a ghost dog, wouldn't you want one? Do we have to feed it every night? I asked. Luke nodded his head slowly, brushing a hand through his brown hair. Then no. It's literally a ghost Doberman Pinscher named Banshee, and you wouldn't want to keep it as a pet? You know they're aggressive dogs. If I didn't feed that thing, it'd kill me. This is stupid, I chuckled. There was silence. Maybe you're right, Luke's voice trailed. Molly panted and came closer to us, tongue lolling out. She let out a small yip and then proceeded to jump into my lap. I felt her fluffy fur in between my fingers as I stroked her, tail wagging. She yipped a few more times. Stop it, Molly. What time is it? Almost four now, Luke answered. I looked across the unfinished basement, seeing pale moonlight pouring in through the shut blinds. I felt chills run down my back, then reminded myself how stupid all of this was. I pet Molly a few more seconds before she hopped down and padded across the basement floor. I heard her claws dragging across the concrete making clicking sounds. Banshee... Banshee, come here, boy, I murmured sarcastically. Ah, uh, shut up, Kyle, Luke punched me playfully in the shoulder. We talked for a while, turned the lights back on, and blew out the candles. We stayed up and played video games for a few minutes, when Kyle yawned loudly. I think I'm gonna pass out. Night, Kyle. Night, I replied. I took a glance at my phone and read the time, 4.32. I rolled a blanket out onto the sofas and rested my head. I tossed and turned for a bit. I kept hearing Molly yip every few minutes. There was no light at all, other than the small amount coming from the window. I shut my eyelids tightly and tried to drown myself into darkness, pushing me into sleep. It still didn't work. Molly growled lowly. I wondered if it wasn't her. 
I was going to open my eyes when I remembered what I said to Luke. This is stupid. I kept my eyes shut. Banshee, Banshee, come here, boy. I heard Luke's voice echoing inside my thoughts. This is stupid, replied my own voice. I fell asleep after a few minutes. It was short-lived. I awoke with a jolt as I felt a tongue swipe across my face and padding feet with a jingling collar as Molly ran away. I stood up and decided that she needed to be put in her kennel. I flicked on my phone's flashlight. The white ray illuminated the room. In the corner, I saw a blurred white shape. It groaned quietly, then yipped a few times. Molly, shut up! I whispered, yelled, approaching her. I came to the corner. As I lifted her up, a trail of urine streamed from her and onto me. I nearly dropped her, but sat her softly back onto the ground. What the hell, Molly? I grumbled and held her up, then started up the stairs. I came into the kitchen and put Molly into her kennel. She whined, then curled up in her bed. She yipped one last time at me, before she laid her head down on the floor looking like a mop. I shook my head at her, then combed through the kitchen. I found a small rag, got a bottle of vinegar spray, and then got a rag wet in the sink. I took slow steps back down the creaking wooden stairs into the basement, when I heard Luke's voice. Molly, go away, he said. What, Luke? Hey, Kyle! Molly woke me up. A pit formed in my stomach. I heard a low growling. Luke, get up here, I whispered. What? Come upstairs now. I heard him take a few steps. A dog tag jingled. His footsteps stopped. I heard his breaths, labored and dying. Filled with shock, my hands became sweaty, my heart sank, the growling repeated itself. Luke, I said quietly, get over here. His breathing became faster. Words sat on my tongue, ready to be spat out. An idea started to knit itself together. Banshee, Banshee, come here, boy, I said clearly. Nothing but a snarl in response. Banshee, Banshee, come here, boy, I said, this time more sharply and sternly. Paw steps. Then nothing. A dog tag jingled. Banshee. Ban. I heard something hurtling through the darkness, and then a gruff bark. I dodged to the side as a black blur jumped past me. I opened the basement door, then slammed it shut. There was a mangly silhouette caught in the door in the frame. A putrid odor washed over me, and I retched. I pushed the back of the beast through the door, then slammed it shut and locked it. The sound of barking could be heard. I rushed down the stairs and found Luke, standing in place and shaking like a leaf. Crap! Is it just gonna stay there or what? I asked Luke. I don't know. I need to look it up, he replied, yanking his phone from his pocket. His fingers moved like lightning as he typed something in. I turned the lights on and started to pace back and forth around the basement. Luke looked up, his eyes wide. Banshee doesn't leave unless you tame him, or unless sunrise comes. I swallowed hard. How hard is it to tame? Luke gave me a knowing look. I nodded my head carefully. So, it's almost sunrise anyways. It'll come in in like an hour or so. We just need to wait it out, right? Luke shrugged. Just be glad your family isn't home right now. The minutes crept along. I felt my heart steadily throbbing. I passed the time by simply thinking. I saw Banshee, spit dripping from its jaws, a snarl on the back of its lips turning into an aggressive bark. I shook my head and laid back on the couch. I fell asleep once more. 
I heard the sound of crushing metal from upstairs as Molly yipped loudly. Banshee cried, and I listened to the noise of something snapping. I froze. All went silent again. For a few minutes, I couldn't hear anything but Luke and I's soft yet forced breathing. I heard paws trotting along the hardwood floor of the kitchen, coming closer to the basement door. There was a scratch. Then it went quiet again. My blood ran cold as another scratch came. Banshee scratched up and down the door and didn't stop. I listened to it for ten minutes, then twenty. The smell of rot was everywhere in the basement. Do we tame him? Luke asked. I shook my head no. He nodded. Banshee began to bark violently. The scratching became louder and the barking became howling, then screaming, high-pitched and ghostly, like the wind in an October night with a hint of something sinister added. Banshee didn't stop until the sun came up. I walked up the stairs and reached the shaking hand out for the doorknob. I pressed it against the cold metal and turned. The tang of blood in the air poured into my nostrils. Sunlight crept in through the windows, though shadows still loomed about the house. I took a few steps out. I walked around, every step echoing inside my own head. I turned. Molly's kennel had been completely ripped open. I felt my heart skip a few beats. A few more steps around the house revealed her scattered bones everywhere, the drops of blood spilled on the floor. In the corner of the living room was her skin, like a bone cover discarded of. No organs could be found. Luke called for me. I ran through the house back to the basement door. Scratches ran up and down it. There was a part of the door that had almost been torn through. In the middle of the door, though, there was a carving. Banshee did a trick. And it got him a treat. Close to 20 years had passed since I had been to this place. The still night air felt heavy as my friends and I walked down the short gravel road which cut through the thick forest. The trees along the sides had grown into a single canopy that completely engulfed it. There was five of us going out to a party. Shortly after entering the road, our playful teasing and banter had settled to near silence. Light from the full moon shone through the branches above cascading gently down to dance around the ground. Every one of us was now on edge ready to jump at every unknown sound beyond the tree line. Ryan was the first to attempt to break the tension with the mocking moan that only managed to heighten it. None of us could quite put a finger on what was wrong, but we all felt uncomfortable, like we were being watched. We reached the edge of a clearing where there was a small playground and soccer field which had overgrown from years of neglect. The bleachers were beginning to rot and fall apart. The tension fell away as we entered the clearing and got out our drinks. Soon, we had all but forgotten the uneasy feelings from the walk out here. We began to joke around and had a pretty good time. That is, until we decided to leave. None of us were willing to be the first one to cross the tree line. We looked at each other, all with the same expression. Then after an unspoken agreement, we all stepped forward in unison. Each step was harder than the last, and there was no other way out. This road was the only path as far as I could recall, the only way to get back to society. The silence was thick as we walked, every fiber of our being fighting to go back to the clearing. Yet we pushed onward. The snapping of a twig in the trees sent us all running forward in hope of reaching the highway only two miles away. We slowed down to catch our breath. Our hearts pounding. Adrenaline was all that was keeping us pushing forward. We were still drenched in an uneasy silence that was only broken by a faint, rhythmic tapping. Nobody noticed it right away, but it was there. It had been there from the first step we took to leave the clearing. It was slowly growing louder and seemed to be coming from all around us. Snap! 
Another sound echoed through the forest. None of us had caught our breath, but we all immediately began sprinting again. Samantha tripped and fell, scraping her left knee and both elbows. She didn't take the time to worry about it. She just jumped right back up and assumed sprinting after the rest of us. The tapping, now almost deafening, suddenly stopped as we stepped onto the pavement of the highway. Looking back, Jeff let out a relieved howl. We all joked about how there was nothing in the forest. It was the second time we had come to this place. The first two were two weeks prior. This time, we were here to prove to ourselves that there was nothing to fear in the forest. This time, we were here to prove to ourselves that we were not afraid. We arrived earlier than the last time. The sun was still in the sky. I guess we thought that the light would make it easier. But to be honest, none of us wanted to return in the dark again just in case. In the night of the evening, we made it to the rundown clearing without incident. So we decided to hang out for a bit and have some fun. Around midnight, Mark stepped into the tree line and started tossing rocks and sticks to try to spook us. We all laughed and I shouted for him to knock it off in a half-teasing, half-nervous tone. Just then, the forest went silent. Not even the chorus of crickets could be heard. A few moments later, Mark's voice echoed through the trees as he screamed, then his voice cut off suddenly. The rest of us half expecting Mark to come out of the trees laughing half uneasily as we recalled our first visit to the forest. We started to shout for Mark to come back and to stop messing around. Samantha began to cry and we all decided to start looking for him. As we approached the tree line, we could hear and see nothing beyond save a faint rhythmic tapping that sent shivers down my spine. We had all gone ghost white. As the tapping began to get louder, the rest of us bolted for the road, but there was an unnaturally tall shadowy figure standing underneath the canopy at the entrance to the clearing. It looked like it was holding something or someone over its shoulder. We had no choice, so we ran towards it as a group, our minds only guided by fear and adrenaline. As we approached, we could see Mark hanging limply over its shoulder, but the thing holding him was featureless and black. Before we could reach them, they vanished into the trees. Our fear got the better of us, and we just kept running. I wanted to stop and look for Mark, but I couldn't stop myself. I had to escape. The four of us kept running, not looking back. We didn't stop until we hit the highway where Samantha, Kaylin, Ryan, and I finally looked back. It may have been my imagination, but I think I saw something lingering in the shadows just beyond the tree line. I still don't know what happened out there, but it's been 20 years and Mark is still missing. Today, I came back for the first time since Mark's disappearance. It has been eating at me all this time, but I was too afraid to return. What happened in the forest? Was it all my imagination getting the better of me? Could Mark still be out there? We told the police about our experience. They believed none of it. We were the last to see him, so we were the only suspects in the case. Why did I come back? I needed to know if it was real. I needed to know if I could have saved him. I needed closure. But with no evidence, there was never any closure. I arrived in the late morning, hoping that the light would help me find something, anything. The road was exactly the same as I had remembered it. The clearing, too. The bleachers had rotted away a bit more, but beyond that, the place was untouched by time. I brought a baseball bat, and I also had a switchblade tucked in my left boot just in case I needed to defend myself. The entire time I felt uneasy, unable to shake the feeling that I shouldn't be there. The air hung still, and I could only feel the tightening in the back of my neck as the feeling of dread set in. I had only sat down to have a snack, but when I looked around the forest, it was dark. Night had fallen, but when could this have happened? At that point, my nerves were on high alert and I began to notice that all-too-familiar tapping sound faintly keeping a terrifying rhythm. 
That sound replaced the natural sounds of the forest till it was the only thing I could hear apart from my own heartbeat and quivering breath. Images of Mark draped over a blackened figure flooded my mind, causing me to look towards the road and my only chance of escape. To my relief, the way was clear. No unnatural creatures blocking my path, yet the tapping echoed louder and louder all around me. The moonlight keeping the clearing relatively bright, making the darkness of the woods that surrounded me feel heavy reminded me that anything could be lurking just beyond view. Panic began to set in as I gripped my bat. I gathered my courage and headed to the edge of the clearing. I'm not going to get any answers if I don't get a grip, I told myself before forcing myself to step out onto the shadowy darkness of the forest. Each step brought me closer, closer to finding the truth, closer to the sound that haunted my dreams, closer to fear. It took everything I had not to give in to the fear to press on. Driven only by willpower and adrenaline, I walked into the darkness. The tapping had grown into a defined pounding. Every shadow moved as if though they expected me. Through the pounding, I thought I could hear an eerily familiar voice calling my name. Faintly at first, I could swear I heard Mark. But as I focused trying to triangulate the source, the voice slowly shifted, sounding less and less human as it grew louder and graspy. It sounded like whatever it was, was being strangled. My next step sent me sliding down a wet, slimy rock, my head landing against it. Its surface was covered in black sludge. Where I had fallen, I was completely trapped in a rocky crevice blocked at one end by a stone and the other by a large moss-covered tree. I felt something hoist me up, but I couldn't tell what it was at first. But I knew one thing. It was not my imagination those many years ago. Well, I hope that you guys enjoyed the cryptid and unexplained encounter stories tonight. If you have a story you would like to send to me to narrate on my channel, email it to me at zackbabytv at gmail.com. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and spread me like butter.